Greetings, everyone. This is Rock and Roll Spot Connection with the Weekly Comic Book Roundup. And uh, once again, got another short, got another small week, um, largely because of the fact that uh, there are five Wednesdays in March this year. So, yeah, we're going to. So, we're not going to have. So, the amount of books gets stretched out a bit. For once, at least. Anyway, so kicking things off, we've got this week's Marvel books. I'm going to start with Children of the Atom, number one. So this was a book that got uh, announced well over a year ago. Um, it was supposed to be one of the first new... Uh, it, was, it was intended to be one of the first new ongoing... Uh, X-Men titles after after the events of uh, House of X. However, um, because of, you know, the global pandemic, it got delayed, and with it being delayed, Marvel put it on the back burner for a bit, and like, okay, well, we gotta make a few changes here and there, you know, make sure it lines up with, with everything else. We don't wanna put too many things out all at once, or, you know, but yeah, so. The issue begins, um, it's, uh, it's being narrated by, uh, Cyclops Lass, Beatrice, a.k.a. Buddy, um, explaining that, you know, she, since she came over, she always felt different. For a long time, she didn't figure out why. Then, she saw the X-Men on TV one day, and she knew. So her and but her and the uh, children, the uh, rest of the children of the Atom, we, Marvel guy, Cherub, Gimmick, and Daycrawler, uh, take on a uh, group known as uh, oh, Hell's Bells, all of whom are form. Most of whom are uh, depowered mutants, but former depowered uh, criminals um, who sadly have not received, gotten their powers back. So, nor are they gone to Krakoa and hope to go into the Crucible and whatnot, so yeah. Anyway, so uh, our young heroes take them on. They managed, and they actually managed to. Uh, do a good job taking him down and minimizing uh, collateral damage. There's a, uh, a website entry on the uh, on the Hell's Bell explaining that uh, they were a group of mercenary mutant women under the direction of Cyber and often affiliated with a large drug cartel. Consi the line consisted of Briquette, Tremolo, Flambe and Vague. Uh, there was also a mutant named Shrew who was, part of, who was part of the crew, but quit and later agreed to testify against them in exchange for immunity. Uh, the remaining came into combat with X Factor when they attempted to kill Shrew for her betrayal. Powers of the group Briquette had superhuman strength, molten hot skin, melting, cable melting objects on contact, invulnerability, and claws. Trouble low, energy blasts, vibration waves, Flambe manipulates fire and flames by controlling. Op Oxygen molecules cannot produce flames, but once they are lit, can make them hotter and focus them into jets. Kind of, kind of a like an improved version of pyro to a degree. Um, vague with uh, flight and, and invisibility. Uh, it set, states that all of them, with the exception of Briquette, were depowered on M Day, but still operate as career criminals. So, uh, after defeating the Hell's Bells, they teleport away. And run into three of the X Men Pixie, Magma, and Maggot. And they basically explain that, you know, that, yeah, they, 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 know what, they know what to call it, they just haven't gone to Krakoa yet because uh, they, they, they've got their reasons, you know, they're, 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 they will eventually. And, you know, the, the, the that's that's fine. You know, the X-Men were... Um, anyway, um, 
on the summer at the summer house. Nightcrawler, Wolverine, Cyclops, Storm, and Mar and uh, Marvel Girl have gotten together for pool drinks and presumably dinner beforehand. And they're discussing the uh, kids. Um, Wolverine basically thinking, "Hey, let's take, let's bring him. Let's just go. Okay, let's just go bring him." And kind of he does at least get talked down to. Okay, look, how about one of us goes to talk and find out what's going on with him. Um, Gene does kind of help with with that suggestion as well. Reminding Cyclops that uh, sometimes he forgets that there are stage steps between non-interference and all-out war. Storm volunteers to go and uh, talk to the kids. Uh, we then get we then see uh, gimmick and Cyclops last in their civilian identities. They're High school, or high school students going to uh, Corbeau Preparatory High School in Brooklyn. Um, they've gotten tickets to go see Dazzler, and one other student gives gives them some grief about you know financing mutants because they're building an army on their secret island, and their their and the their medicines are really poisoning up regular people. Blah 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 blah, which actually I'm. I'm not surprised to see that that would come up as a, as something that would be brought that would come up in an, a post Creco X Men basically. But uh, apparently, uh, Buddy is smitten with uh, Cherub. However, it does seem that uh, who uh, and he plays basketball. Also playing. Also, uh, Marvel guy plays basketball too. They they are they're and the two are are good friends. Are good friends. Uh, another student has come back. He's been sick, but now he's all better and he pretty much shows up. Uh, Cherub, whose real name is Gabe, um, and there's actually even. Gabe gets knocked down, and, and then the, the returning does he does get helped back up. But apparently there's a, uh, a website called Mutants Unmuted. Um, videos of, you get, you know, listed as the newest video with Wolverine fighting Ghost Rider wearing a cape. Uh, then there's a featured video of Joe Carnation and Dazzler spotted in Tribeca. Possibly a collaboration between the two. Uh, there was footage from the news media, mutant fights, sightings, fan encounters, and forum. And so, later that night, the five of them get together and they do decide that yet. Yeah, they suit up, they go to the gate under the Cody Island Pier, they step, and get ready to go through, start their new lives on Krakoa. And they enter the gate, and they're still on Coney Island. So apparently, they aren't mutants. Interesting. Uh, working theories. They're maybe they're inhumans, or in, inhuman descended, such as uh, Miss Marvel, Kamala Khan. Uh, I'm presuming it. I don't think it's going to be a case of their outfits do the abilities. At least not. Maybe for some of them, but not all of them. But even then, I don't think that's the case. I think. I think they're going to turn out to be uh, inhumans, or like I said, inhuman related. Which brings us to our next book of the week, X Factor number eight. Where we left off, uh, the team had been investigating the recent deaths, yes, plural, of Teresa Cassidy, aka Siren, 
former member of X-Force as well, a long time ago, and more recently a, for a member of a past iteration of X-Factor Investigations. There was a there were there were some questions about her her recent deaths though. They seemed deliberate. Like she had like she had uh, decided to that she had affected her death herself. Um, turns out though that she is under the possession of a death goddess named Morrigan. Who, who she uh, had a, a run-in with back in her days of X-Factor Investigations. Um, Morgan utilized the sonic hypnoti hypnotism of uh, um, uh, Siren to hypnotize Polaris into basically sabotaging X-Factor's continued investigations of Siren. How it, while North Star had uh, Dakin sent to keep, or sent Dakin to keep, basically to tail Siren. And when Dakin tried to call and, or call and to give an apprisal of things, Lorna got the feel of the call and, because of the hypnosis, lied through her teeth, which I boy pointed out to everyone. However, Eventual Dakin was or Dakin was uh, tortured by Morgan, um, brought back to the boneyard. He's and however later that night, most of X Factor is dead, except with the exception of Prodigy, Iowa, and a few others. So the issue begins um, earlier. It should also be noted that uh, Dakin and Aurora had a, had a moment. She was apparent. Her and uh, her brother were watching a movie together. She went to go to the bathroom. She actually went to see to go talk to uh, to Dakin. Um, amazing baby, uh, procedures, uh, Warwolf is, uh, barking about something, he, he sees something, Procedure runs into, Rachel runs into Eye Boy, who appears to be thoroughly freaked out, um, but he, he is hiding it well, but yeah, it does, it both Eye Boy and uh, Amazing Baby see something. They just don't know what exactly it is. Um, Prodigy's been investigating the uh, timeline of his own death. Um, using the picture that Speed provided as uh, evidence. The first hidden layer reveal shows some photo edits. Um, second hidden layer reveals GPS coordinates and a date timestamp embedded in, in the metadata. A third hidden layer reveals device information, saying that, clarifying that the phone was the photo was taken and posted from his old phone. And then his, his preliminary hypothesis is that he both edited and posted the photo for himself to find later. He tagged Tom Speed in it so that it would be make Tommy aware of it, thus able to provide an alibi to his previous assumption about how he died. Why? He, but he does wonder why he would bury probative value like this. His final assessment is uh, that um, the chronology of the Five and, and Prodigy pieced together and his cause of death were incorrect. Uh, the picture was not taken at Club Pepper in West Hollywood, but was posted from there. The photo was posted from his old phone, which he has not seen since before his demise. And he's no relation to what happened to it upon his death. The photo was taken subsequently posted during a cerebral backup blind spot, meaning the week between one backup and the next. Why, he, he wonders. Then he needs to know to himself at what point does he involve X-Factor, as this is all a personal log of his. 
Um, in the, in the uh, downstairs, uh, Dagan has a nightmare where he's reminded of his... Uh, starts off as a dream about him and Aurora that then becomes a nightmare flat reminding him of his uh, recent dealing with Morgan. He's not happy. Makes his way upstairs and eventually finds Eyeboy. Tells him basically to shut his fear up. Because he can feel Eyeboy's fear. And gave him a bad dream. Eyeboy knows what's going on. There's a thing he can't see, but it's in the boneyard. And he almost he almost keep kind of sees it, but he can't look at it. And that's when Morgan shows up. Uh, but uh, Dakin, I went amazing baby run. They discover that, he, that uh, Prestige, Polaris, pretty much everyone else, everyone but the three of them are dead. And uh, so iBoy and Prodigy and Amazing Baby escape. Uh, the next day at the hatchery, as the members of X Factor are resurrected and being woken up, uh, I boy and Prodigy explain to them that the uh, boneyard's haunted. Um, Xavier begins to offer his assistance. However, uh, Polaris is like, no, 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 no. They'll handle it. You know, but she, she, she thanks Xavier for, for it. And she also uh, asks not to tell her father that uh, she died because she's humiliated enough as is. Uh, but Xavier does say that if Xavier should hypothet need any hypothetical assistance... So she gets into the, into the zombie situation at the boneyard. You know, let let them know. So they make a plan. Um, Procedure and Polaris will deal with uh, Morgan, while uh, North Star and Aurora deal with the zombies, and Dakin deals with Morgan's giant bug thing. So they do. Um, Prestige and, and Polaris take down, take her down, and Siren asks Lorna asks Polaris to help her because apparently Morgan is already trying to come back. And but Polaris is like, you know, we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna let her hurt you anymore. And. Northstar very pointedly asks, you know, Siren to tell them about the uh, the new bargain she struck with Morgan. Uh, Xavier also has apparently sent a, an email to Northstar about uh, Iwoy's evolving abilities, asking to be kept apprised. Northstar refuses to do so. And that is where the issue ends. Which brings us to... Ah. Our next book. Wolverine, Black, White, and Blood, number four. So, Wolverine, Black, White, and Blood. Uh, we got three stories. First off, first up is The Art of Loss. It takes place uh, shortly after the events of Uncanny X-Men number 173. Uh, in the issue, um, Wolverine was set to marry Mariko Yoshida, 
uh, a woman he had met in Japan, fallen, saved, fallen in love with. It seemed perfect. You know, they they loved each other. She she made Logan happy, and she left him at the altar. She had been mind controlled to do so, but still, it broke his heart. And so, Logan did what Boy naturally assume Logan would do after getting his heart broken. Went out to drink. And consider, given the fact that he's got a healing factor that pretty much keeps him from getting drunk, yeah, he's drinking a lot. Closed down, he claims to have closed down nearly every bar in Tokyo. Well, thrown out of some. Started had a, getting, gotten into a few fights, and he's also fairly sure that it, he wasn't always the hero, and it was not his best day, and also not his worst, though. Sad to say. You take a sniff at the air, though, and see me looks out, looks to the side, and seemingly like Sabertooth's waiting for, him, standing there waiting on him. And Logan just says, "All I know is you ain't is you ain't him." And if you want to touch anybody you're more dangerous than, than Sabretooth. Truth has to be Mystique. Mystique wants, his, wants her daughter, Rogue, back. Um, it's explained, and Wolverine simply says, you know, hey, look, you know. At the moment. Rogue join Rogue is joining the X Men. Okay, she's an X Men. That's all. That's all there is to it. You know, if, if you're not if you're not a horrible if you're not a, a terrible person about things, you know, hey, eventually she'll probably come back to you as your daughter. Probably not. Probably won't come back to the brother, but you know, you'll have your daughter back. But if you if you push things, you're like to lose her forever. And so. But yeah, the two of them duke it out, and yeah, Wolverine gets uh, Wolverine takes his, his hits, but he gets Mystique good, and she. Uh, we're talking a, a slash through here, and she re basically realizes, oh, Wolverine ain't screwing around right now. She jumps into the into the ocean to escape. And Storm shows up at. And Logan just simply said, you know. So, you know, Missy's hurting, losing Rogue. It's cut her deep, and, you know, I can relate to it right now. So they go off to have a drink. After all, Logan could use a friend. Which brings us to our next story. Read what you sow, which takes place in the aftermath of Uncanny X-Men number 229, uh, wherein the X-Men fought off the, the Reavers. The Reavers being a, gr a group of cybernetic mercenaries led by on-off Hellfire Club Inner Circle member Donald Pierce, who was also a cyborg, and made up partially of members of the uh, former uh, Hellfire Club security guards uh, who were in grievously injured by Wolverine during the Phoenix Saga and various other run-ins with the X-Men. Um, but yeah. They tracked them down their base in Australia, whooped their ass, took the base over, yeah. Anyway, it turns out the, uh, the Reavers hit a, uh, a bank in Singapore. Uh, it's, not the, it's not the biggest financial fish in all of Singapore, but it's sure it's definitely the flashiest. Kind of get security, all that fun stuff, and well, hey, when you say, hey, you know, this is, you know, nothing is, nowhere safer than, than here, someone's going to come along to say, are you sure about that? So Wolverines track the Marauders. Turns out they, they're, that while the X-Men were fighting the Marauders in Australia, Australia, however, or not Marauders, the Reavers in Australia, basically a, a B team of the Reavers was hitting the other financial institutions of Singapore. And, uh...
You know, and then the this group of reavers stole thirty million dollars as well as killed thirty innocent people. Well, so Logan decides he's gonna go get some payback for those thirty, 30 innocent people. Cuts his way through the Marauders, but or the, not the Marauders. Well, I don't know why he was saying the Marauders and Reavers. Cuts his way through one of the Reavers, gets shot, um, and thrown in the ocean. A uh, and he's bleeding. Well, a great white comes up to him, and yeah, he bites off a great white. But of course, where you know, where one, if one smell on his blood, there are others. So yeah. He manages to avoid the sharks, gets back on, on the Reaver's boat, cuts through the... Combination of cutting through them as well as uh, tossing and or tossing them to the, the sharks. Um, leader of, the, of this uh, group of, re of Reavers, uh, and former Hellfire Club guard uh, Angela Macon attempts to escape, but... The yacht they stole has a harpoon has a uh, harpoon launcher on it, and well, yeah. As he tries to as Megan tries to escape with his jetpack, well, yeah. Logan shoots him with the the uh, harpoon, pulls him back down, and well, the story ends with the boat going off into the night with uh, a couple of sharks following, and as. Uh, and make it being used as chum. Final story. A little tale called Sticks and Stones. Wolverine is on vacation. Funny, for someone on vacation, he appears to be falling from the sky and covered in blood. But he... He went to the Savage Land to go on vacation, and of course, who does he run into in the Savage Land? Completely... No, not meaning to, just... But Sauron. You know, the guy that turns himself into a... The guy that can turn... That can cure cancer, but just wants to instead just turn people into dinosaurs. You know, I mean, hey, don't get me wrong. Noble goal... You know, curing cancer is a noble thing, but if you want to... Being able to turn oneself into a dinosaur is kind of cool, too, though. But you shouldn't try to force that on, other, on others. So, you know... If he, if, he could, if he could turn himself into a dinosaur and cure cancer, that'd be great. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling. Anyway, so, yeah, they're, they're duking it out. Uh, Sauron figures, oh, Wolverine's trying to, once again, to fight me. Well, I'll have to kick his ass up all over the Savage Land. And Logan's like, man, I'm just here to take a vacation, okay? I don't care. And then a T-Rex shows up. Because it's a Savage Land, and that, there are living dinosaurs in the Savage Land. Um... Wolverine's like, uh, I'll, I'll deal with you later, Sauron. And Sauron's like, eh, no, 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 I'll deal with you now. Tries to hypnotize the uh, T-Rex. And gets batted out of the way. And so then the T-Rex tries to eat Logan. And Logan carves his way out of the T-Rex's skull. He explains to Sauron that, uh, from the looks of things, the T-Rex's brain's been petrified. And uh, Sauron's like, huh, so that's why it didn't mind control me. Or that's why I couldn't mind control it. Only one person, there's only one person that could do that. Garok, the petrified man. And yeah, Garok has a, has a bunch of uh, followers and dinosaurs at his command. And so Sauron and Wolverine team up. To fight him, uh, and you know, he fired I beams at Wolverine. You know, it's like, hey, there's a cure for I beams. It's called cutting the, the person's eyes out, which is exactly what Wolverine does, and then he decapitates his Garok. And so, Garok's followers run and escape in fear. Um,. Wolverine and Sara have a brief post team up conversation before we decided to get back to fighting each other, and that is where the issue ends. And I actually believe, I think this is actually the end of the series, the mini series too. All right. Yeah. 
Next up, we've got Deadpool Nerdy 30. So, for those who might not be aware, 2001 marks the 30th anniversary of Deadpool's first appearance in New Mutants number 98, way back in the bygone days of 1991. Yeah. A lot has changed about Wade since then. He's become more of a hero than a villain. Uh, well, closer to hero than villain. I'll, we'll put it that way. And he's also probably one of the more popular uh, Marvel characters. Anyway, so the issue begins with a various multiversal Deadpools charging in, guns blazing against some against the, an entity called the of a Matrix. Uh, it seems to kill Lady Deadpool um, and various other versions of Deadpool uh, until it opts a uh, we'll, we'll call him Spidey Pool because he's basically Deadpool and Spider Man comes along and so the other matrix and and uh, and he's just like you know this is just a cash grab but come on you know but uh, they talk a bit and uh, apparently Spidey Pool makes the other matrix laugh so she takes a more humanoid form rather than a floating head and asks if he wants to do something really insane. And so, they... Spidey pulls him and says, well, the hell not? They're probably going to cancel us in a couple months anyway. And apparently, there's now a, a positive pregnancy test, which is where the issue ends. Which is where the story ends. Which brings us to our next tale. Baby's First Cable. Deadpool's first birthday. Um, cable shows up with a gun the size of a Buick. Um, then another cable shows up. The, the first cable is there to kill kill dead, Deadpool and save the universe. Then another cable shows up. Like, no, 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 we have to protect Cable to save the universe. Then an, an even older cable shows up. Shoots them both and takes Deadpool into custody and Deadpool activates one of the grenades on uh, the third cable's arm and there's an explosion and maybe Deadpool flies off on the uh, severed arm. Severed, time, severed cybernetic arm. Then uh, Cable, as we know him normally, as well as current Cable, Space Store and all show up at the remains of the house. Um, apparently they're not the only Cables there. There's a Gorilla Cable, there's a female Cable. The T-800 from, from Terminator 2 is even there. But they're like, eh, hey, Wade's dead. You know what, let's go celebrate. Uh, one of the cables mentions he knows that he has a place in the 20th century that makes a great biohazard burger. But no, Deadpool isn't dead. He's quite alive, but still a baby. Next up, we've got Best There Is. Um which takes place years ago at Leslie Nelson Ca High School in Canada. Oh, Canada. Uh, it's, it's prom night, and Wade... And somehow Wade, uh, Wade Wilson, soon after it said school, has convinced himself that it's actually his Sweet Sixteen birthday party. When, uh... And he crowns himself prom king when Wolverine shows up, or prom queen, when Wolverine and a bunch of Hydra agents show up. Uh, Wolverine and, and Wade get uh, linked together with a, some kind of mystical bracelet. So, yeah. They kind of work together. Kind of, sort of, work together because they're forced to against Hydra. Um, Wolverine, Wade keeps Wolverine from taking some uh, bullets to the back. Um, and... Explains that, uh, you know, Wade's got a gift. He doesn't know what it is exactly, but he's got something on it. But Wade's got something. You know. And Wade kind of says, you know, it would be more helpful if he knew what it was. 
But uh, Wolverine explains that, uh, you know, we don't find it. You know, just remember, you don't have to be good at everything. Just pick one thing. Be the best at that, you know? But he, but wait, you guys, what about almost the best at, like, 35 things? What about that said? As Wolverine leaves. Next up, we've got, Lo, there shall come a hero. Maybe. On Wade's 30th birthday, he was in the, uh... He, he was during his days with the Weapon X program, and, uh... His guard, Francis, brings him a cake. Which Francis then stomps on. Talks about what had happened, you know. But he uh, says, that, what, "What could become of this origin story of his? You know, super steroids. Well, he could, maybe he could be Captain Canada's Captain America, or he iron himself out to any country." Except for the fact that, you know, he does come with the other side of roadkill. So he decides, you know, he can become the world's number one primo kick-ass mercenary. Like Taskmaster, a sword is so totally cool. So two! Guns, too. Lots of guns. But he's going to need pouches. And a, and a distinct look. Maybe some, well, maybe not distinct, but, you know, a, a look that works for him. You know, someone some looks cool and cute. Feared, but also beloved. And spunky, just like he didn't say Spider Man. And yeah, no, no, he's not friendly, he's not neighborhood, he's not seeing the wall, so that's kind of gross. But he does dig something similar to Spider Man's costume. And he just, you know, but he's gonna be a hero, he's gonna help people. And, and a pimply but plucky Canadian 15 year old will grow up to play him in a movie someday. But he's got to say he's got to say his wish out loud, or it won't come true. He begins to say he begins to say, "I wish that," and the candles on the birthday cake burn out. Next, we've got short story "Tall Tale" featuring Deadpool and Agent, uh, Agent X, who are inadvertently teaming, who are both taking a job to. Help or to stop uh, Stiltman from stealing some tech from a company. Uh, also involved are Deadpool and or not Deadpool, Domino and uh, Diamondback. Um, we also learned that um, apparently um, Stiltman prefers to be a bit free underneath his cot his armor. Yeah, but part of the armor gets blown up. Um, which leaves the remain and Domino and Diamondback leave while the remains of Wade re regenerate. Then we've got uh, what was this last one called? No chill whatsoever. Uh, apparently, Deadpool kidnapped a. Uh, a a drug scientist, you know, the idea being, you know, hey, I'll take you to the CIA. You can, you know, turn, you, you can testify against your, your boss and, you know, probably cut some kind of deal for yourself. They stop at an ice cream, at an ice cream place. Turns out that uh, there's a, a specific chain of ice cream parlors. Uh, we get an actual frozen taste land. Uh, and apparently Deadpool has been breaking into like every single one he finds and, and putting in a cache of weapons behind one of the walls. Um, and as, as, well, a cache of gear, I should say. Um, the, uh, but the, uh, the costume he's got there is actually an old costume, an OG. You can tell because the back's all red, not just, not black and red. Um, but it turns out it was also, uh, it was, it was the cop, the outfit he was wearing way back in X-Force number 11, when his at on off girlfriend Vanessa, posing as Domino, stabbed him a bunch. 
But uh, Deadpool decides that the uh, the drug side, the, the drug developer, no, nah, he he gets he's gonna get chained up in the uh, he's gonna be turned over to the CIA because the CIA is likely to have him you know make drugs for them instead of you know a drug lord. And so yeah, that's not exactly helping anything. So he grabs a cake. It is his birthday after all, and leaves. Which brings us to our uh, next tale, Party for One. Wade has been, uh, Deadpool's been all manner of chained up and put in a coffin and dumped to sea. Decades from now, I might add. Uh, a month later, he's talking to him, he and his master having conversations with one, with one another. This continues for another month. He, also, he's, he's growing a beard. He's trying to figure out how he got to where he was. Um, possible Shikla may have, is that why Shikla may have been involved? But he finally does remember when his daughter L or Ellie rescues him, explaining that. Uh, she worked on reversing his comm system and turned it into a tracker. She knew he went missing in New York. And when she couldn't find him on land, put on a sea drone and, well, yeah, I don't know. So she asked if they should go after the uh, guys that did that, that put him in the box, but he, she's like, you know what? To hell with him. Let's just go, let's go live a little. Which leads us to our final tale. Co-written by Deadpool co-creator Co-written and drawn by Deadpool co-creator Rob Liefeld The Dow Pool But uh It's basically a, it's a retrospective uh, From Deadpool's point of perspective of the last uh, Deadpool's point POV from the, of the last 30 years or so Talking about his costume, his various looks over the years Um Popularity, bringing up his old buddy Cable, the fact that he, take, he takes a lot of he can take a lot of damage, and of course, pouches, so many pouches, which are apparently being hand sewn by Rob Liefeld. Also, Rob Liefeld wears a sweater vest with that, with that has pouches, and is referred to as Levi's. And that is where the issue ends. All right, moving on to our final Marvel book of the week. Taskmaster, number four. Where we left off, Taskmaster was, was, had been uh, framed for the murder of Maria Hill. Nick Fury told, informed him that uh, Maria Hill was working on something called the Rubicon Trigger. But it requires the kinesic signatures of three... Of three Three, not two, three people. Three specific people to unlock. Those three people being Phil Coulson, um, Amy Han of uh, South Korea's NIS Tiger Division, and Okoye of Wakanda. Well, also, on his tail is none other than Black Widow. And against uh, White Fox, she got, ooh, she did get close. But Tasky managed to escape claimed his in and claimed his innocence. So the issue begins with uh, Taskmaster doing a halo jump into uh, Wakanda. He arrives, takes down breaks into the royal palace, and gets captured by the Hatat Zarazi. Um, he also talks some smack to, to Okoye, and asks for asylum. But he will prove his worth. And, but... She's just like, yeah, no, uh, we, we haven't forgotten the fact you were part of Hydra's Avengers. And he's like, well, okay, that's true. 
Like, but I didn't attack Wakanda. I struck Atlantis. Surely Wakanda does not, does not shed tears for Atlantis. After all, there's a lot of bad blood anymore between Atlantis and Wakanda. And... But he gets, in, he gets sent to the dungeons and his mask taken. But he's got to say that, you know, the Wakanda dungeons, he, for, well, as prisons go, three to four stars. Or three, 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 and a, three and a half stars. Presumably of either four or five. No shackles. Uh, food's pretty good. Lots of time to exercise. Downside, they took his skull. Um, but he, he's given his mask back and brought before Okoye, and he fights the Hazazarazi. He explains that, you know, with them wearing vibranium mesh, he, 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 well, first of all, he states that, yeah, they're the Hazazarazi. Loyal, well-trained, but ultimately, henchmen. And, well, there's one thing Taskmaster knows. It's henchmen. He used to train them. Like, seriously, that used to be like his shtick, was that he trained all everyone's henchmen. But he explains that they, they got a vibranium mesh sheet, so you can't punch them or kick them. Or, you know, you can't, you basically, you can't hit them. But you don't have to hit, hit someone to hurt them. And he's not talking about feelings. So as he, which he says to himself as he breaks one, the armor of the Hatat Zarazi. Um, and yeah, he, yeah, he takes them down, and then Okoye comes, and there's the fray. And he's actually kind of impressed. They fight. But, uh, and Tassiter tries flirting with her. But, uh, and uh, he even explains that, uh, he even says that she's magnificent. And they're, they actually, their fight is actually a quality fight. Probably one of the better fights he's had. Yeah, he, he's got her kinetic signature, though. Apparently, though, she, he, he has yet to impress her. But that said, he's not going to be the one to uh, say uncle. And he actually wins the fight. And he gets sent back to the dungeons. And so, later, she comes to him and, and with one of the Hatazarazi explaining that uh, they figure out what to do with him. While there are any number of punishments she might like to visit upon him, she truly thinks that she can't think of anything worse than the U.S. criminal justice system. And elements of the U.S. intelligence services have reached out to them, they're quite keen to see him punished for his crimes during the Hydra regime, the event of Secret Empire. He's taken to a waiting twin jet. And it turns out that that was all part of his plan. It was Fury who just picked him up. He's got the signature. And they're headed back to the U.S. to end this. While Black Widow's been busy collecting weapons to take to go after Taskmaster with. And that's it for this week's Marvel Books. As always, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Links to my Facebook, Twitter, Patreon, and PayPal can be found in the description box down below. This is Rock and Roll Spock signing off saying, live long and rock hard.